A rare and ancient plant has been waiting for its long-lost mate. The only known specimens of a particular species of cycad called E. woodeye are male, all clones of the same plant found over 100 years ago deep in a South African forest. Now, a team of researchers is on a mission to find the elusive female of the plant, with the help of drones and artificial intelligence. In this episode, we follow their determined quest to save the species. I'm Gemma Ware, and this is The Conversation Weekly, the world explained by experts. It felt like a sort of botanical love story, (laughs) harbouring the hope that a female might still be out there. Laura Chinti is a research fellow at the University of Southampton in the UK, where she focuses on the intersection of art, biology and nanotechnology. In 2020, she was researching extinct plants around the world when she came across Encephalatus woodeye, a rare type of cycad. It's an ancient plant, like a relic from a town by gone. As one of the rarest plants in the world, E. woodeye is highly sought after among collectors and botanists. It's prized for its striking appearance. It's got a scaly trunk and large, long fronds that form a majestic crown, like a palm tree. On top sit golden cones used for reproduction. They've been around since before the time of dinosaurs, but today they are actually the most threatened and the most endangered plants on our planet. Focusing on the Encephalatus genus, which is native to South Africa, the Encephalatus genus consists of many species of Encephalatus, of which E. woodeye is one of them, Even though there are very strict laws in South Africa that protect these cycles, so it makes it illegal to remove, to own, to sell or to trade them without a permit. I was surprised to find just how severe the illegal poaching had been on their survival. Cycles have become these symbols of botanical rarity, with some specimens selling for up to hundreds of thousands of pounds. To put that into some perspective, that's significantly higher than horn from black rhino, another very endangered species that's sold in the black market for around £70,000. The rarity of this E. woodeye cycad makes it very difficult to get information about how many specimens actually exist and where. It was like a detective walk because this, everything's so secretive around this plant. If you've in contact with botanical garden, they don't release any information about the Iwodai. For example, Durban Botanical Garden, I found out much later that they didn't want to share any details about Iwodai with me because they had just had a massive theft in their botanical garden. So the information is very sensitive and they don't know who is accessing this information or where this information is going. Laura then discovered that there was a specimen of the cycad at Kew Gardens, a botanical garden in London in the UK. The specimen in Kew Garden was sent over from South Africa in 1899 and is still going there today. When she reached out to Kew Gardens, she was told that access to the plant was restricted because of COVID-19. The glass house where the e I resides in Kew Gardens was closed to the public because of COVID. Actually, a lady in Kew Garden who worked there, she helped get videos and photos from me in the beginning. And then later on, when the, the gardens opened, I was able to visit and see the plant. Larry, you're from South Africa, where this plant is originally from, but you've never seen one before. So what was it like when you did actually first see it? When I came up to the coo plant, I was just surprised how small it was like a solitary sad plant in a glass house, isolated from the wild on its own. Because obviously it's grown in South Africa, so the weather conditions in the UK is not appropriate. (laughs) It's a lot smaller than the South African counterparts, which are growing at six and a half to seven metres. E. Woodeye has been called the world's loneliest plant. In 1895, an English botanist called John Medley Wood was on an expedition on an ox wagon in the Nagoya Forest in eastern South Africa, not too far from Durban. He came across a single male version of the cycad at the edges of the forest. 
He looked around to see if there were other plants nearby and he concluded that there were no specimens there. Now, cycads are either strictly male or female plants, and the only way to really tell them apart is by their golden cones. The male cones, for example, are generally more elongated, whilst the females are more rounder and more egg-shaped, if you like. And cycad reproduction relies heavily on the fascinating interaction between insects where the pollen gets transferred from the male cone to the female cone. Without a female, pollination or sexual reproduction is not possible. What Wood had stumbled across and then eventually gave his name to was the only ever wild specimen of E. Woodeye. Between the period of 1903 and 1916, Stems and offsets of this plant were gradually removed from the Nagoya forest, from the wild, and propagated in botanical gardens, and then thereafter in botanical gardens worldwide. But the plant was already under threat. It is also used for traditional medicine. We have an image of the Ewood eye, and it's probably the only photograph that we have of the Ewood eye in its natural environment from 1907. And in that photo, you can see the bark on one of the stems is really badly damaged. And this was the reason why it was eventually removed from the wild. The damage from the bark and stems is actually consistent with their use in traditional medicine. In 1916, the forestry department removed the original stem from the wild, fearing that it would be destroyed. It was taken for safekeeping to a protective enclosure in Pretoria. And this was what marked Ewodai's extinction in the wild. And this stem actually died in 1964. All the Ewodai that exist are essentially clones of this original male discovered in the Nagoya forest back 129 years ago. So it's a lonely plant, and without a female, it remains the last of its kind. Nobody has yet understood why a female specimen of Ewodai has never been found. It could be a combination of factors. It could also be that it was already just a small part of a once larger population that was already heading towards extinction by the time it was discovered. It could also be from over-harvesting, habitat destruction or damage from traditional medicine practices. The plant also became so endangered because of widespread logging. Between 1909 and 1912, the Nagoya Forest was also heavily logged by the, a company called the Nagoya Forest Company to supply timber for the mining industry, specifically supporting gold mines. So this logging may have incidentally impacted the other plants and maybe including the cycads in the forest. Today, E. Woodeye is still hugely endangered. As a result, it's thought that fewer than 500 specimens exist in botanical gardens and private collections. You say that all of the plants are clones of this original E. Woodeye specimen. Why is genetic diversity itself important for the survival of the plant? Genetic diversity is vital for the survival of any species including plants, but for plants like E. Woodeye, having a diverse gene pool would allow for much greater adaptability to different environmental stresses and also reduces the risk of being totally wiped out by, say, disease or bad environmental conditions and so on. There have been some attempts to preserve the species. A hybridisation programme that started in the 1980s has been trying to merge E. woodeye with closely related cycad species to create a female. But these plants have very long reproductive cycles and it's slow going. So now they're in the second generation and they look very similar to E. woodeye. And um, I think the next generation may even look identical. But the thing is, despite that they may look similar, these hybrids will never be the true E. woodeye because they inherit much more from the mother plant. That's why Laura says that finding a female E. woodeye in the wild would be groundbreaking. It would let the plants produce sexually. It would lead to seed production for the first time since it's been discovered. And I think this would create new plants with a mix of genetic traits. Uh, from both the male and the female parents, and it would boost their genetic diversity 
and improve their chances of survival and adaptability. Armed with the history of Iwadai and the challenges it faces, Laura has set out on a quest to determine if there are actually more of these cycads left in the wild. She began by tracing the plant's last known locations, hoping to uncover clues to the whereabouts of others. Well, we were driven by the hope that a female Iwadai might still be out there. Because as far as we know, the Nagoya forest, where it was originally discovered, hasn't been completely explored. And then there have been documented visits to the original site around 1912. And there was a local report stating that the eastern and northeastern sections of the forest had been studied. She found other reports of sections of the forest being explored, including one from 1993. But despite all these efforts, no other plants had been found. But since then, we haven't had any other reports of further searches. Laura decided to start hunting herself using modern technologies. All the previous searches were all done on foot. So our approach is different in that we are using remote sensing technology to explore the forest. I thought it could cover a much larger search area more efficiently. I came across um, an interview with Dr. Debbie Jurt, and she was using drones as part of her search to count species in the area, like crocodiles and so on. And so I emailed her and I got in touch to explore a possible collaboration. And as it happened, Debbie is a conservation scientist. She's also a drone pilot, and she also works at the provincial conservation agency that actually manages the Nagoya forest. We started with small air flasks using planes to survey the forest from above. How do you program these drones or planes to look for the Ewood eye? These drones are programmed to fly in a specific pattern, in our case, using GPS coordinates. And these drones were equipped with cameras and they took overlapping photos, which were then aligned and stitched together using a software to create very detailed maps, what we call, I call mosaic maps. These mosaic maps are made up of separate photographs taken across a wide area, which are then stitched together, the same way that a phone stitches together panoramic photos. Also on the drones, um, we use specialised cameras. And these cameras um, can capture images across five different wavelength bands. So you've got the red, green and blue is what you and I can see. And then also other bands, which we cannot see, the infrared, and something called near-infrared. So each band gives unique insights. For example, the red egg band, they can detect photosynthesizing vegetation and plant disease. The near-infrared band allows us to distinguish living and dead trees. And also, it can even differentiate between different plant species. And then what we do, we apply a false color technique to these bands and then you can see various features much more easily. Laura and her team take all the different types of photograph they collect and feed them into an algorithm, teaching it how to identify a female psychid. Remember, female cones are typically wider and rounder, and male cones are elongated and narrower. When we started, we initially used detection models used in the palm oil industry and they use it for counting palm trees, but then we optimize it specifically from our viewpoint and to the unique shape of cycles. If you look at a cycle from above, or even if you see it, they look very similar to palm trees. So we trained our own image recognition algorithm, and this involved annotating hundreds and hundreds of images of cycles to create data sets that were necessary to train our model. Wow, so these are images of existing cycads in botanical gardens around the world that were used to train... Yes, on our databases of the Encephalitis genus. We also used a generative AI system to create generated images of cycads and to improve our model's ability to recognise cycads in different contexts. And recently, we've been working with trying out LIDAR technology 
and first person view drone. LIDAR is short for Light Detection and Ranging. It's a remote sensing technology that uses lasers to create precise three-dimensional maps of surfaces and environments. So we're combining many different technologies that allow us to explore and analyse the forest in new and exciting ways. Laura and her team launched the first search expedition in 2022, and they've done three missions to date covering different parts of the forest. They keep analysing the data, hoping to come across any images that could be a psychid, ideally a female one. Have you found anything? No, not yet. I hear you still hopeful. We're still hopeful. Um, we've covered a very small percentage of the forest. So we've only covered just over 2% of the forest. How have you felt about the mission so far? Uh, I think if there were psychers in the forest, I think this suggests that these psychers have been collected anyway because they're heavily posed. So that makes me a bit concerned. But again, as I said, we constantly refining the technology, we're constantly adapting and yeah, trying our best. Although Laura hasn't found any psychids in the wild yet, she says after publishing details of her search in a story on The Conversation, she received a lot of encouragement from around the world. I've received many messages and um, I've been moved by the encouragement and support. For example, people have sent photos of psychids in very diverse locations, so from Kenya, India, Panama, even here in the UK, um, Italy, Madeira, with the hope that these photographs might assist in our search. Others have uh, given suggestions of other potential areas where they think um, we should open the search to, so as far as Colombia and Venezuela even. But I think what moved me a lot is that many have expressed gratitude for our search efforts and how that this search has inspired, to quote one letter, a great understanding of the importance of biodiversity preservation. I've also received offers of help to actually physically do a third party to search for the forest if need be, and also requests for collaborations and similar projects in other countries. These messages mean a lot to me and I'm incredibly grateful for the support and help in the search. For Laura, the story of E. Woodai brings home big issues around biodiversity and conservation. Often when we think of poaching, we think of animals, but plants get poached too, and they're just as important for the biodiversity of our planet. I think the discovery and then the disappearance of E. Woodai in the wild is a very powerful reminder of just how easy we can lose an entire species and the rich biodiversity that they represent. It's not really a story just about one plant. I think it's also a reminder of how many species are struggling because of human activities. So just like the e eye, many plants are facing similar threats, be it poaching, deforestation, climate change. Every plant species plays a role in the ecosystem and losing them can have a ripple effect on our environment. Maybe it's also a call to action for us to take better care of our planet. Absolutely. Massive good luck. And please, will you come on and tell us again on the podcast if you do find it? I will, for sure. Thank you so much, Laura. It's been really fascinating. Thank you. You've been listening to The Conversation Weekly. This story came out of a series on The Conversation led by my colleague Jenna Hutper called Plant Curious. It's about a step change in research that's shaking up the way scientists think about plants. So far, we've run stories about delicate flowering plants that outlive the dinosaurs, epic battles fought beneath the soil and the ultrasonic noises tomato plants make when they're thirsty. We'll put a link in our show notes to where you can read more of these stories from the Plant Curious series, including Lara Chinti's article about her search for E. Would I. This episode was written and produced by Mend Marawani and me, Gemma Ware, with production assistance from Katie Flood. Sound design is by Michelle Macklem, and our theme music is by Nita Saul. Stephen Kahn is our global executive editor. You can connect with us on Instagram at theconversation.com or email us directly at podcast at theconversation.com. 
Do also sign up for The Conversation's free daily newsletter by clicking on the link in our show notes. And if you like what we do on the show, please support the podcast and The Conversation's project more broadly by going to donate.theconversation.com. Please do also rate and review the show wherever you listen. It really helps us reach a wider audience. Thanks so much for listening.